And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Even before Hawaii-born Patrick Vinton Kirch graduated from Punahou School, at 13 he was interning at the Bishop Museum with malacologist Yoshio Kondo. Quote, at the time, despite his strong interest in snails, he already had a passion for archaeology. That is my favorite sentence from his Wikipedia <laughs> entry. <laughs> Receiving his Ph.D. from Yale in 1975, he made his first return to Hawaii after several years away, joining the staff at the Bernice Pauahi Museum. Beginning his second sojourn from the islands in 1984, he went to the University of Washington, serving as director of the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture. Five years later, he took a position at the University of California, Berkeley, retiring after 25 years in 2014 as Professor Emeritus. He then returned a second time to Hawaii, where he is now a professor of anthropology here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He is the author of more than 250 publications, over 20 of them books. For our purposes, I will call your attention to his 2016 memoir, Unearthing the Polynesian Past, which tells the stories of his Pacific expeditions and adventures. I also want to note that he will be appearing on Sunday, October 22nd, from 1.45 to 2.45 p.m. at the University of Hawaii Manoa William S. Richardson School of Law as part of the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. He will be talking about the recently published revised edition of Feathered Gods and Fish Hooks, The Archaeology of Ancient Hawaii. First appearing in 1985, it was the pioneering synthesis of ancient Hawaiian civilization from an archaeological perspective. The revised edition now brings the field up to date, incorporating the results from literally hundreds of archaeological projects undertaken throughout the Hawaiian Islands over the past 35 years that have benefited from tremendous technological advancements, and also the book presents an authoritative account of the origin and progression of Hawaiian culture prior to the arrival of the Europeans. Moderating this event will be Sarah Collins, senior archaeologist with Pacific Culture Consulting Services Incorporated, and an affiliate graduate faculty member in the Anthropology Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and formerly a regulatory archaeologist at the Historic Preservation Division for the State of Hawaii. And because Pat's talk today will be a personal account of a span of over 40 plus years, let me add a personal note. Sarah Collins is my life partner. <laughs> We were both 25 when we arrived in Hawaii in 1980. I had been hired into a tenure-track assistant professorship in the English department in this building, and I think I'm in better shape than the building has <laughs> Sarah was working on her PhD from the University of Toronto on Great Lakes Archaeology and Physical Anthropology. Neither of us had ever been to Hawaii before. She did not have a job. Less than two weeks after our arrival, we attended the English department beginning of the semester party. Among many people we met for the first time was the magnificent Morna Kershaw, creator of many good things for many people. Oh, you are an archaeologist, dear, she said to Sarah. You must meet Pat Kirch. Picking up on that lead, Sarah went to the Bishop Museum for the first time in hundreds to meet this Kirch. Less than a month later, she was on a field crew on Molokai, where she lived for several months, providing us with very different perspectives on our new home. The crew chief was Marshall Weisler. To this day, he and Sarah co-author articles on Pacific archaeology. Working steadily after that, she shifted her PhD area of study, completing a dissertation on Hawaiian archaeology and physical anthropology. And because Pat Kirch has always maintained strong contacts in Hawaii, centering much of his own research and that of his students here, he has been bouncing in and out of our lives in enjoyable and productive ways ever since. So it is fitting that Sarah will be introducing Pat, because Pat introduced her to her life in Hawaii. And in the spirit of biography, I would also note that the smallest incident, the smallest kindness, can often profoundly affect the course of people's lives. And for us, Lorna and Pat did that. It gives me now great pleasure to introduce Pat Kirch, who will today offer us some reflections on returning home to Hawaii. Pat. Oh, 
Oh my God, go. Nice to be back. Back at this uh, seminar for the second time. I realize you're actually coming to these things. What I've done, I've written some reflections on a series of topical entries, really. Um, so I'll let you know what each topic is. As I move so the first one is just, just a few things about what it was like in the early 80s before I left Hawaii. And, uh, just a few things that came to my mind as I was sitting writing these notes. So I was, as Craig said, on the staff of the Michigan Museum at the time. Um, I also was a affiliate faculty member here at UH, and I was teaching classes part time on and on. And I'm reflecting how about that time. One of the things that was happening was what we were calling the Hawaiian Cultural Renaissance, was really just getting going in a fairly big way. Um, I think back to, and Craig, you were there, I think, and Sarah, the Connie Kapila concerts at uh, Andrews Amphitheater with Gabby Pagdabui and Joy Noah Keawe and all of them was singing. That was kind of, you know, what was going on. Protecta Hall Ave Ohana was very active. And, uh, I think it was probably in the late 70s, they were illegally occupying the Hall Ave, and then by the late mid 80s, they were sort of getting some legal status and suing the Navy and so on. Um, project that Craig just mentioned on Molokai and Sarah, we engaged Sarah on, uh, definitely involved a group of local uh, Native Hawaiian activists, and on the lake, Colette Machado, uh, others uh, trying to uh, protest and stop, and couldn't fully really stop it with the Cuvella plantation development on Molokai, and then it's come through. And then I was thinking, and then <clears throat> Eileen Anderson was mayor of Honolulu, and she stopped the rail. Yeah, you remember that? Because you gave back the federal money, there was going to be no rail. This is what I left, you know, I left to work. Um, so that's just a few thoughts, right? That's my first level section. Uh, what was it like in the 80s before leaving? Wait, now why did I leave the islands? Some of you may not know. So, uh, actually in 1982, so I had been teaching uh, part-time here at UH, and the anthropology department here actually made me an offer to Tenure track probably went for UH, but they lowballed the offer. How much you lowballed it? And uh, the director of the Michigan Museum gave me another offer, and for it. so I said, No, sorry, UH, I'm not going to be on your track list. Until I realized 47 years later, I would be. <laughs> but, so I decided to stay at the Michigan Museum. But a couple of years later, by 1984, uh, it was becoming clear to me that the museum was in trouble. Um, financially, it was in trouble. Terms of the senior leadership, and the then director at Kreutz was probably before asked to step down, resign, and the trustees initiated a search for a new director. And by the way, they used the term director back then. This was before museum directors became CEOs. Everybody wants to be a CEO these days, but they don't know why. Anyway, I was approached uh, to apply for the directorship of the work Museum, as Greg mentioned, at the University of Washington. Which also came with a faculty appointment, and I thought, well, this, this may be a good thing to do what's happening in Bishop Museum. If you can't hear me, you can move closer. There's lots of uh, seats up here. So, um, but the museum trustees had, the search committee had narrowed their search down to two candidates Roger Green, a very well known uh, Polynesian archaeologist, and someone named Donald Duckworth. Which is a rather odd choice. It was actually W. Donald Duckworth. Who was born there? He chose the Donald Duckworth. Anyway, uh, there's an unknown entomologist and middle range administrator of the Smithsonian. Uh, so when I was told by Bill Morris, who was the chairman of the museum's trustee, he took me to lunch at the Pacific Club. And he said, uh, Well, we're going to go with this guy, Duckworth. And I said, well, that's cements it for me. I'm going to the University of Washington. Because I had met this character, Duckworth. And among the things he said in an interview with the senior staff was, quote, Mission Museum is a research institution. I'm going to make it into a museum, end quote. And I thought, well, I'm not exactly sure what he means by that, but I don't like the sound of it. And so I'm getting out of here. Now, I never thought that I would be gone from Hawaii for a 35 years. I thought, yeah, five, maybe 10, I'm going to become a museum director. In Washington, I'll get museum director experience under my belt. And when this guy, Duckworth, leaves, I'll 
be in a position to, have to apply and come back to the Bishop Museum. That was my uh, was my goal. And of course, in the end, I was away from Hawaii for 35 years. Uh, the first uh, four and a half were in Washington and Seattle, and then the rest at UC Berkeley, which recruited me in 1989. Uh, just as an aside, I did twice put my name in the hat for the directorship of the Bishop Museum. And the first was uh, after Duckworth was finally forced out after 16 years of ruining the institution as far as I was concerned. Uh, I put my name in the hat and they were preparing to interview me, but then I was told by the headhunter firm, search committee firm, that the trustees had voted irrevocably to move the museum lock, stock, and barrel to Cogago. Part of the plan with the legislators to put the medical school there, and then I want to put the museum there. And I said, Is this this is definite? They said, Yes. So if you take the job, you're going to be in charge of moving the museum to Hong Kong. I said, No, thank you. I'm pulling out. Of course, they didn't do that because, fortunately, Bill Brown, who they hired, convinced them they did the idiocy of that plan, and so the museum stayed. And believe me. Anyway, second time I put my name in the hat was 2007 when Bill Brown, who I think was, was doing a pretty good job of trying trying to turn things around, but he left after only five years. And I put my name in again, I was actually interviewed by the trustee search committee down there in the executive dining room of the First Hawaiian Bank. Uh, but I took a look at the interviewees. Alan, you might have been in that group, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe not, anyway. Um, and I could see they really, the trustees had very mixed views about what they wanted. It was very conflicted. And I uh, wasn't convinced that they really wanted at a research institution. And then I took a look at the finances, which they sent me financial spreadsheets, and I said, I'm pulling out. So I never became director of the Bishop Museum. Now, next topic is how I ended up coming back to Hawaii. That's an interesting story. Um, 2007, I was working on Maui doing archaeology. I started a project there in 95, so I've been working there quite a long time. Going out every summer, sometimes in the spring. And I wanted to uh, have a look at Kalpo District. I was working at Kalpo really. And Kalpo Ranch is owned, well, it wasn't until very recently, it's now sold to Kamehameha Schools recently, but at that time it was, uh, Kalpo Ranch was owned by a consortium of like four owners, and one of them was Jimmy Haynes. Uh, Jimmy Haynes was at the time on the Board of Regents here at the university. And one uh, of those school, Brad, Native Hawaiian, loves archaeology. So I contacted him and said, sure, you come on, and you know, we'd love to let you have access to the Ranch. I want to go with you, look at sites. So we're walking over the pasture lands of Cabo Ranch, looking for sites. And he says, uh, would you consider coming home to Hawaii and teach at UH? And I said, yeah, you know, if you guys make an offer that matches my situation at Berkeley, why not? So the next thing I knew, I was contacted by the, so then I think, Vice Chancellor for is that Academic Affairs. Academic he was doing affairs. both. He yeah, was three hats. Doing both. John Spacey knows his name right now, correct? Uh, well, uh, uh, Ostrander. Yeah, yeah. Neil Ostrander. Gary Ostrander. Gary Ostrander. Gary Ostrander. Neil So he says, you know, I hear you might be interested in the position and so on. So anyway, I won't belabor all this, but I said, yeah, it might be. And we actually got a negotiation. They actually made me an offer in 2008, uh, which was a pretty good offer on the table. And, but what happened in 2008, you remember? It's called the Great Recession. And the value of our property in California, I'm not making this up, literally tanked 45%. And so we looked at this and we said, let's man, a mortgage on this bill. We said, we're going to have to pay the bank, pay the bank to get out of this place, and then we'll have zero money to buy a house. In so I had to turn the offer down. That was an interesting point. But, so then what then? But, well, Rich continued to be interested, and off and on for the next few years, we had some, had some talks with um, Chancellor Apple when he, before he got, he got sacked, and then I had talks with Denise Cohen, but nothing ever seemed to go anywhere. And then finally, in August of 2018, uh, by then I was on the board of the Bishop Museum, and I was out for a gala dinner, <coughs> and uh, it was Amy Marvin, and said, oh, there's David Lassner, the president of the university. I said, oh, why don't you introduce me? So she did, we walked over. He said, oh, we've been hearing a lot about you for the last several years. It seems like you never want to come to UH. I said, that's not the case. I said, I did turn down an offer once, but for these reasons, and I've never had an offer since. He said, oh, I think I see the problem. 
two weeks later, I had a letter of offer from uh, Jimmy Scone and Michael Bruno. And uh, so <clears throat> here I am. So that's how I came back to uh, Hawaii. And uh, so I began my appointment here in anthropology on January 2nd, 2019, with an office in Dean Hall, which was very much uh, deja vu because I had had offices in Dean Hall when I taught there part time in the 80s. And they say, you know, things never change. Um, in some ways, Dean Hall looked the same, kind of like Bagginville, except not actually it deteriorated more in, in the 35 years that I've been gone. But I appreciate the fact that the UH administration has, has actually renovated my lab and all of this. So it's actually a very nice shape right now. It's actually air conditioned. All right, so that's how I got back here. Now, some initial impressions upon returning. So the French have this saying, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, right? The more things change, the more they stay the same. And I think not true. So, you know, I first got back here, and mind you, I, it's not like I'm totally away for 35 years, like, don't remember, but mostly on my way. And as we move back, you know, I drive through some neighborhoods, and I still think this way today. I drive on Wailai Avenue, or I go to the Kalihi Fisher Museum, or Kapahulu, it seems like I've never been away. Same, same old houses, same old storefronts, maybe the stores have changed, but it doesn't look that different. Yeah, then I get on H1 and I go to Kapo Bay and I'm totally lost. I don't think this new city, you know, it didn't exist when I was, you know, here in the 80s. Uh, I get completely lost if I try to go to Pearl Ridge or that area. Um, the traffic on H1 seems worse than it is up in the Bay Area, the freeways. Forget about all these really week weekend drive to the North Shore, you know. So, yes, I mean, uh, things have changed. And then there's the rail. We thought it was gone away, we thought Miley Anderson had killed it, and there it is, creeping ever so slowly toward the blocking the views of the mountains, etc. It came back from the dead like a zombie. Now, local politics, that's something else that you can say never, never seems to change, right? Especially the meddling of the legislature and the affairs of the university, for example. So during my first, I think the first semester here at UH, uh, Senate Higher Education Chair Donna Kim went on a warpath against the faculty, saying that we weren't teaching enough. And we had to fill out these worksheets of everything we were doing, et cetera, et cetera. And she's still on the warpath. Now, just as an aside, I, I, I had a chance to meet Donna recently uh, at another Mission Museum Gala event just in August. And she's actually been a very good supporter of the museum funding legislature, which we're very happy about it. So I went up to her and said, introduced myself. Didn't tell her I was a professor at first. I just said, oh, I want to on the board and I want to thank you for supporting the museum. And we had a very cordial conversation until I mentioned that I was a UH professor. <laughs> and then everything changed. <laughs> and she became very defensive. She explained to me that, you know, she was working on behalf of the interests of the people in the state to make sure that people like me taught enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's one of the things that never changes. Now, another thing I discovered, minor point, but I discovered that you're not supposed to say the mainland anymore, right? You have to say the continent. I'm tempted to ask, which one? There are eight of them after all, right? So, anyway, but what are you supposed to say? The continent. And Kamaaina, that's an interesting word, right? Kamaaina used to mean that you were actually born here, raised here. Now it seems to mean you have a driver's license and you qualify for something called a Kamaaina <coughs> discount. <coughs> that kind of amuses me. People have been here six months say, oh, I'm a Kamaaina. These are little things. Uh, another thing <clears throat> on the very positive side, it became evident on returning home is that the, what we call it, you know, in the 80s, the Hawaiian cultural renaissance has really made tremendous strides in the time that I was living on the mainland. Oh, sorry, the continent. Um, Alelo Hawaii is now being widely taught, spoken, and you actually walk around here, people speaking it on the street. Ula Chan, other cultural practices are thriving. They even teach Omelo Hawaii at the Omelo School these days. Can you imagine that? Warren Thurston must be turning to her in his grave. <laughs> I wish I had had the chance to learn Omelo Hawaii when I was a student, but they didn't teach it. We had a Hawaiian club, and we sang some songs. No learning Omelo Hawaii. And uh, so, on the political side, obviously, Kanaka Maoli now much more outspoken about the historical grievances against them and asserting their rights. And one of the things that became so 
clear about that. The first year I moved back was the Mama Kao movement, obviously. So that leads me into my next topic, which is labeled Sherwoods and Unananibo. Sherwood slash Unananibo. So as the Mauna Kea struggle began to unfold, here on Oahu we had our own little conflict over the city and county's park in Waimanalo, uh, which is locally in the Sherwoods or Sherwoods Forest. Uh, I don't even know what I'm talking about. So Teresa and I, we bought a house over in Kailua, side of Mount Willie. And we started going regularly in the early mornings. We have a ridge duck, back dog. Nani and we would go down there to walk. Nani at the beach, she loves it. And of course, <clears throat> we saw then the bulldozing going on in a large area in the so called Sherwood Forest, where Mayor Caldwell was determined to construct a sports field and a parking lot for 400 cars, which I was one to wonder because the big existing parking lots were never full. And so why do we need 400 more parking spaces? Tourists? Questions are being asked. Anyway, some of the local Waimanalo uh, activists uh, who were protesting this found out that I had done archaeology there many years ago, and I began getting phone calls saying would I get involved in the effort to stop this park development. And I hesitated at first. I didn't really want to insert myself into local politics right away. But one morning I got a call saying there was a big protest happening down there. Sure was. So I, I got in my car, I drove down, I got into the crowd. And the speeches of the Kukuna, especially were at moving. And then somebody asked me to speak, they recognized me. And so I, I did, I got up and I talked about the 1967 excavations. The earliest site that we know of, the Hawaiian Islands, right there, Wyman Hollow. There was a break then in the proceedings, and we were told that because the area that had been bulldozed, the protest was happening on the road in front of them, the area that bulldozed, we were told it's off limits. Tape, so then somebody took down the tape and they said, Oh, it's okay. And then, of course, there are police there. The no, police say it's okay, you can walk in. So I said, Okay, let's go we'll see. And I just wanted to see if I could see any artifacts, we didn't any evidence or anything like the logic. And on this uh, bulldozer push pile, I found a flake. So it's a, you know, an actual art of a dike stone and flake. That's we don't consider it like a single flag very significant, but it was a, actually a cultural object. And I was showing it to a couple of the uh, people there, and then and I just tossed it back where I found it on the sidewalk. The next thing I know, a couple of the police officers came up to me and they said, Oh, we really found this significant artifact. I said, No, it's just a flag. You know, oh, no, we have to see it. Okay, so I go back to that pile of found it again and said, Here it is. Okay. And they take it as evidence, an evidence bag. <laughs> I'm like, listen, you guys, not risk. Oh no, it's just significant, it's evidence. And then they had me go to their little tent and I had to, they insisted, they wouldn't let me go until I actually filled out an evidence report, right? which I wrote, this is just a flake, it's not significant. <laughs> but anyway, so I think that was on a Saturday. Uh, on Monday morning, I got a call from my old friend Paul Claymore. Was a principal archaeologist with Pacific Legacy. And they actually had the contract with the city to monitor the bulldozing stuff that's going on. Bob was, oh, and we're, we're old friends. Uh, and still on. He says, ah, the mayor, Kirk Paul, was extremely upset over this because it, it made the news, right? The media hyped it up over the weekend. They hyped it up that it was an ad, so it's an actual formal artifact. So he says, anyway, Paul says, the mayor wants to meet with you. I said, okay, I'm free this afternoon. So I go down to City Hall. Go to the mayor's office. And uh, Mayor Caldwell calls us in. It's a big table. I don't you don't get in the mayor's office. It's a very, very large, impressive office, like the size of this room. Oh, uh, you know, it's a big table. So he says, so, <clears throat> you know, Dr. Kurtz, you sit here. And Paul, you sit there. A couple other people there, you sit here. And he starts to, oh, and I, so I noticed that on the side table, there was a portrait of Iolani Lohine. You don't know she was. she was a very famous dancer living on San Francisco. Uh, and he had this picture of her with the Miley Lay over it and stuff. And then he begins telling the story. He says, so he didn't talk about the park or the artifact or anything like that. He said, Oh, you know, when I was a boy in Kona, and, uh, you know, I was taught by Ilani Lohine, and it's going on and on about his relationship to Ilani Lohine and so on and so forth. And obviously, he was trying to position himself. 
He finally stopped talking. We went over about five minutes of it. And I said, you know, Eric Crowell, that's really interesting. Because when I was 10, I knew the Alani Rahi man. And I went on and I said, you know, she was the curator of the Alani Palace in the program. When I was 10 years old in the summer, my mother enrolled me in the uh, YWCA across the street to take an art class. And after the art class every morning, I would go over to the palace. And there was there's nobody there except me and Yolani. And she got to know me and she would tell me about the different royal family members whose portraits were on the wall of the throne. And she would walk me around and tell me stories every like, day after day that summer. I would go up there and talk with Yolani Loaini. So I took five minutes to tell a story about that. And my dad gave me an orchid plant at the end of the summer to take to her. So I think I just blew him out of the water because I think he thought my positioning himself in terms of his, you know, relationship with my Rahina, he was going to want to open And he had no idea that was going to come back in that. Anyway, we went on then to talk about what was happening in London. Oh, and I said, look, you know, this artifact's not seen really, that's not the point. I said, the point to me is that uh, what I'm hearing from the people who are protesting in my Manalo is that uh, you're not giving any information and you're not allowing Paul and his firm to talk to these people them know what's going on. And he said, that's not true. We don't have a policy of, you know, uh, can't talk. Whatever do we, Paul? And Paul said, well, actually, Mr. Mayor, we've been told to refer all calls to your office. <laughs> and so he was like, well, that's not my, my, my calls, Paul. You go and talk to them in the uh, free time. <laughs> so, so what came out of that um, was that, well, the, the, the folks who were protesting had, of course, set up a camp at the beginning of the opening entrance to the park and so on. And they put up a sign declaring this to be Hu Nananiho University. Hu Nananiho was an old place name for a Hu Honur, a place of refuge in Waimanalo. And so what happened was over the next few days, um, Paul and Mara Marbrini and myself, they go on credit to Paul and Mara, they brought all the reports that Xerox the wall that had not been released before, made them all available. I gave a seminar at Hu Unananiho University on the early history of Guatemala from our excavations. I have to put that on my CV. <laughs> so every time now, I still go and walk Nani Guatemala, and every time we drive by, and I now see the name of the park is now Unananiho and the development of the stuff and so on. So some things do change, but it's gratifying ways when you can also uh, make a difference you know, and, and stop some change. Um, my next topic is called Bishop Museum. <laughs> Looking at Alan. So, around 2017, I think it was more or less, Bishop Museum hit a low point in its history. Now, the then CEO, I point to this distinction between, used to be a director, and now it was a CEO, it's so changed up. So, the CEO, who was Blair Collis, <coughs> uh, resigned amidst an investigation by the General's office into financial irregularities. <clears throat> I think he wasn't paying off his museum credit card and he was going to buy surfboards and other things like that. But worse than that, under his directorship, uh, his CEO ship, the museum had run up a $10 million debt, by the way, which is still not fully paid off. This was part of his business plan, um, which included divesting the museum of all its research activity, basically. He declared that. Any researchers who wanted to be there would pay their own way, pay their own salaries, et cetera, to the research. Well, I heard about this, of course. And, um, I was still living in California, but I wrote an op-ed piece for the Star Advertising, which they published, saying that I thought this was outrageous and folly. Museums, you know, museums without research are just warehouses of collections that you know, become meaningless over time. Anyway, my uh, publishing that op-ed piece led to an offer from the then interim CEO with the appointed Sissy Farm, by the long perspective, uh, to join the board of directors. She said, okay, well, why don't you come on to our board of directors? And I said, okay, I will. And I've now been on the board for seven years. I'm still on it. I have two more years to go before I have to follow. But I want to reflect on the kind of institution that Bishop Museum is now compared to what it was when I was there in the 80s. Um, I left in 84. When I left in 84, um, the staff, I looked this up in the annual report yesterday, 
staff included 27 PhD researchers, 27 PhDs on staff, and many more technical staff in support of those researchers. And photographers and technicians of all kinds and so on. The strongest departments were anthropology and entomology, but there was also active research in ecology, vertebrate zoology, ichthyology, marine biology. Bishop Museum Press was very active in publishing new works every year. Mary Kamenakuku, he's all over Montreal, was one that came out at that time. My own monograph on the archaeology of the Anthropology department had its own publication series. Entomology published two journals on specific insects and medical entomology. All that changed under Duckworth's 16 year long tenure. I told you, he said he was going to turn it into a museum. And what kind of museum, I don't know. Uh, and, you know, at the end of his first year, he fired a, a number of key researchers, including, for example, Mary Kelly, who did on the staff for decades and was a fond of knowledge of Hawaiian culture and land tenure. Uh, others were shifted into what he called the Applied Research Group, which, of course, I can tell simply that they would go out and get contracts to raise money and the overhead was to support things that Duckworth wanted to do. And of course, the H3 project, which I was going to do, ended up being a debacle for the museum and sort of ruined its reputation for quality of archaeological research. Now, <clears throat> after he left, mind you, some things have gotten better. Hawaiian and Pacific Halls were finally renovated. Exhibits and public programs these days are more extensive and better than what they were in the 80s. I'll grant you that. But the vast legacy collections, I think, in, in archaeology, ethnology, and natural history are underutilized and understudied to the extent that they were previously. Research staff currently, I checked this with Alan yesterday, consists of seven PhD curators. I think there, there's one PhD collection manager and two postdocs PhD. So we used to have 27 and now we that shows you the difference from the institution we have now. As the lone PhD on the board of directors, I struggled to remind my fellow board members the importance of the museum as a center for research in Hawaiian Pacific culture and history. And there are, I think, making gradual progress. Uh, the recent significant increase in state funding finally is hugely important, and let's hope that continues. Uh, I don't know any other major museum across the United States that doesn't get major support from either the state or the city. But the state has never seen fit to recognize the treasure of the museums and support it adequately. So let's hope that um, I don't think it will ever go back to what it was in 27 PhD researchers, but I think it could be a lot stronger in terms of its role in research and research and so on. So if any of you have any plug for um, any of the people in the legislature, please put in a plug for the Mission Museum. Um, getting near the end of my notes. Okay, so uh, the next topic is archaeology and point of practice. Nature of archaeology. What's changed from when I left the university? Huge changes in the last 40 years, I would say. In uh, the 1980s, the Bishop Museum was still the major player in archaeology in the point of the majority of the world. Although it was <coughs> changing. And uh, what we were then calling contract archaeology and now is come to be called Cultural Resource Management, or CRM, was, was already by the 80s beginning to overshadow research archaeology. Now, today, CRM, Cultural Resource Management, totally dominates the field, and there are only a handful of researchers, primarily here at UH, either at the Manoa, Hilo, and the West Oahu campuses, who are actually doing research that's not driven by development of CRM considerations. Bishop Museum has just one curator of archaeology position. Mama Lima is finishing her PhD here at UH Mano under my direction, actually. But she has to spend most of her time just dealing with requests to work with the collections or you know, take care of the collections and so on. I checked on the SHPD's Historic Preservations website. There are 32 permitted CRM consulting firms operating in Hawaii today. 32 of them. I don't, they don't say how many. People are employing, but I know it's well over 100 archaeologists working in these firms. And there are just eight of us listed as permanent non consulting archaeology scholars, four of whom are actually outside of Hawaii or um, continental lines in Australia. So um, I'm just saying it's I'm not complaining about the CRM archaeologists, it's a huge difference from where it was 40 years ago. Uh, 
most archaeology is driven by development uh, considerations. And research itself is such a manini part of archaeology now that when I go back and I wanted to start an archaeological project on Molokai, of course I am a permanent archaeologist, but anytime you do a project, you have to go through a certain bureaucratic you know, steps. And one of them was we had to get a permit from the Office of Coastal Lands and Conservation. And so that required consultation with historic preservation. So I called up the archaeologists at SHPDs in charge of Maui County and said, you know, I need to have you my hand or tell, you know, the Office of Coastal Lands and so on, you know, our project's okay. And he goes, oh, so you're doing an archaeological inventory survey? And I said, no, not, that's not what we're doing. I'm doing research. I'm trying to study the history of agriculture in this valley. Well, you have to do an archaeological inventory survey. No, I don't. It's not what I, it's not what our project is about. I'm not working for a developer or any of this land's not going to be developed. You know. He didn't know what to make of it. He finally he finally said his long sides. He goes, I'll have to ask Dr. Donner what to do. So he never encountered anybody approaching him for research. And he was in charge of the Alton Mali County. Anyway, I mean, it, was, it worked out in spot. They finally wrote a letter and did proceed it. But it just took home to me how you know, little research is actually done as opposed to development archaeology. And of course, this whole change, as many of you know, has led many Native Hawaiians to question the value of archaeological work. Just the other day, Julian Swift was telling me she been on my way. And a local person came up to her and said, you know, we think archaeology is only serving the interests of archaeologists. And it's not, you know, it's not like it. It's not serving our interests. And I can understand that. And Gathi Covello, who is now at UH um, Hilo, was my student at Berkeley, she brought out these issues very eloquently on a commitment, I don't know if you know that book, but it's an excellent piece of work. Uh, it's her doctoral dissertation that we've written as a book. And she brings out uh, all of these tensions that have arisen in CRM archaeology um, between the Native Hawaiian community and the archaeologists. I think things are getting better. Kathy was writing about the low point about 20 years ago, in particular. Things are improving. There's more consultation. Uh, and recently, we've seen a call for a new kind of approach to archaeology, um, which is referred to as Vahi Kuna stewardship that the Kalikuwa Kapakai collective is, is advocating. And I, I think this is a great um, first step. How exactly this is going to be implemented remains to be seen. But I, I think it's great that at least they're putting out some ideas about a different kind of model of doing archaeology. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the research project that I did initiate uh, after back here to play um, on the island of Molokai, and so as Craig mentioned, uh, I got my start in archaeology very early in life, and in that autobiography book, I tell this story in greater detail, but in brief, when I started with Yoshio Kondo at age 13 in the Oncology of Vision Museum, I was really interested in archaeology. So Kondo went down and talked to Dr. Kenneth Emery, who was the famous Vision Museum archaeologist, and said, I got this kid interested in archaeology, and should take him on. Emery said, we don't, we don't deal with kids, we're not interested in kids. And so then Gondo said, well, oh, why don't you just go to Molokai and you know, your father and go camping? I knew about the Lama Valley and stuff. Do your own archaeology. That's the kind of guy Gondo was. So we did. And so Emory had no idea we were doing this. And I found this dune site and I put an excavation pit in it. I had full permission from Malandro and everything, mind you. Um, anyway, I won't go into detail about that. But <clears throat> um, so when so I had this very early start in Malawi, and then in 1969 and 70, by then I was a student at the University of Pennsylvania, and help from Roger Green was set up in a project, and we did really, really extensive work in Malawi uh, with two other uh, students, graduate students at the time. And during that 1969 and 70 work, I had become close friends with Billy Paul Solitario, who uh, was involved at the time, he was in his 30s, he just passed away this past summer, in uh, his early 80s. That's the, very respected old kuna of the valley, of the valley. His mother was a uh, was of the Kamanahu family, of the old family. So I had these connections back to Malaba from you know, 50 years ago. So when I came back to Hawaii, I was I was over on Molokai, and I was there for a spring break trip. I was trying to relocate a map of chaos sites that Bishop Museum archaeologist Stokes had recorded in 1909. Went to Polipo's house to see him and his son. Great. And I'm sitting there on his lanai and talking, and 
truck drove up, driven by a young Holly guy. And Billy Bo introduced me to Galen McCleary, who was the son of Lavinia Courier, who owns Pool Over Ranch. Pool Over Ranch is a big ranch on the East End, which owns much of the law itself, because they were the inheritors of the land that went to Victoria Compton So I got to talk. Galen had heard of me, but this first time he met me. And I said, yeah, you know, it might be nice to do some of you, very logical. So we'd be very supportive. Happy to see you and give you permission and so on. So I jumped at the opportunity. I wasn't going to work on continue working on Bali, but I said, no, I'm going back to Bali. I didn't say, oh, i my roots, so to speak. And so I uh, I worked up a plan uh, for a National Science Foundation project. I asked Tony Swift, who was in the Edition Museum, she'd like to collaborate, and she did. And uh, we were awarded the grant, two year grant. And the topic uh, that we focused on was. Look at the agricultural systems in the valley. Alava was a very famous center for wet tar, very irrigated tar cultivation, but also polluted with slow drought cultivation and so on. So we wanted to build on work that had been done 50 years earlier. And uh, so we got the grant already to go on the spring of 2020, and COVID-19 came and slammed into us. <laughs> but uh, and it could take too long to explain all the ins and outs. We did manage to actually pull off five trips to all uh, longer ones in the summer, shorter ones in between. I want to acknowledge Provost Michael Bruno for being very accommodating because he actually responded to our request to let us go over there even when there were travel restrictions and things. And you do all remember having to have the QR codes and all that stuff. And, uh, so we had to have our tests and COVID tests and all that. But once we could get over to Halal, we had a little on the lake and everybody was testing in front of the NASA. You can't take our but anyway, we, we managed to do it, and um, maybe in another talk I'll tell you some of the results, but briefly we, we have now a tremendous set of data of over 100 radiocarbon dates from all the valley. We've worked out the sequence of development of the agricultural systems. We know the big Hawaii irrigation systems that were being built certainly by the 15th century um, and expanding. We have some wonderful evidence of the tributary stream, the side streams coming down, um, very difficult to manage. Those being converted after the 1600s AD into small irrigation systems and using what I'm calling hydraulic engineering, which is actually building terrace facings and then sluicing soil at times, probably with heavy rainfall, out of the streams and to fill the terraces. So we gained a lot of new information about the nature of agricultural systems. Uh, we relocated. End of the Hay Island Valley that was still to be recorded and did very small test excavations adjacent to architecture and work in Aethel, and we now have a nice chronology for Hay development. Um, and I re excavated that dune site that I put in a test bed in when I was 14 years old, literally about this far away from where I could basically cannot tell where my kid had been. And we did a one by two meter, uh, very carefully controlled excavation, of course, applied all of the new. Technology and means that we didn't have back then. The article just came out yesterday, I think it was the day before, in the Journal of Island and Coastal Archaeology. Uh, but anybody <coughs> wants a copy, I can just let me know and I can send it to you. Um, uh, we redated the site, and now I would really good have on chronology. Um, you know, we identified the charcoal in it, so we know how many plants were being utilized, and all of the uh, fall material. Anyway, so. Literally have come full circle from my test pit when I was 14 to <laughs> three feet away, uh, 73 years old. So. And just to conclude, um, so you know, I, I left away in 1984. I, I never dreamed I'd be on the inland Sorry continent for 35 years. Um, but that's the way it goes. And uh, you know, as much as I enjoyed living in Cala Frisco, I never really saw that as my I'm really a kupo kahaina of Manoa and so on. It's given this opportunity, I really want to come back and share my knowledge that I've gained through our technology. So, mahalo pia for coming today and listening to me. And we definitely have time for questions and comments. Yes, Nancy. You had me at Gabby Pahanu. <laughs> I felt this has been a bush-based and glorious, beautiful evocation 
Um, so I had a, a quick clarification. Um, I, I was unclear how the Vinny Courier's property interfaced with your work in Halaba. Oh, okay, so Puhoku Ranch, like I said, it, Halaba has a series of small kulianas that were granted by the Heli, right? So those are owned by the Hawaiian families. Most right. they have something sold. We didn't work on those because the land uh, issue, ownership issue commission is too complicated to get off. And most of those parcels are that you can have 50 you know, people who have part interests and so on. So you get everybody to sign off, you know, risking quite so much. Right. Yeah, so, uh, but much of the valley floor, which was <coughs> the, the, the uh, wildland, was given to Victoria Kamamalu and then became Bishop of State. Bishop of State sold it to Pulhova Ranch. So Pulhova Ranch owns that. So we worked where we actually excavated, it was all on the lands of Pulhova Ranch controls. And they've been really, you know, very helpful supporting the those. Years. Housing on the ranch. Can you say something about perhaps some of what you consider to be the more uh, important finds from your expedition? Well, important finds. I mean, to me, the, we were trying to focus again on the history of agriculture and sustainability. So, to me, have now. You know the data to uh, describe how these systems have developed over time and how they operate. That's an important finding. To, to me, it's, this project is not about like artifacts or that sort of thing. Although we did find a really, really beautiful bone fish up in the dead so. But it's, this this kind of archaeology is really about dirt, <laughs> quite literally. We're collaborating, by the way, also with Noel Lincoln. I should like to mention that he was a soil scientist here at New Age, and so a lot of the work that we did was actually digging in these agricultural fields and then testing uh, with Noah's help what's the fertility of the soil, nutrient content, that sort of thing, and then the charcoal getting radiocarbon dates to get the chronology of the development of the agricultural system. So but no pretty artifacts. It's like the kind of part yeah, that's really Was there a range of artifacts at any time? Uh stone flakes uh, and to the extent you Instead of the artifact, charcoal, which is an artifact, but lots of charcoal. And then we did things like uh, with these soil samples, for example, we were 25 and then sent them to Auckland as a specialist who extracted pollen, bubble finalists, starch grains, so we actually had evidence of what crops were being grown in these terraces. And all these were just at the stage of starting to, to work this up for publications. And it's two, two years, two and a half years of hard field work and data gathering and now we're at point where we start to generate a series of articles on this. The Bellows site still the oldest? The Bellows site, OIT, is the oldest known, right? It's, and I can't have to to my students, that doesn't mean it's the first site. We'll probably never find the first site. Probably Waikiki under some hotel town, right? No, seriously. Uh, but it's the oldest one that we have good Dates for by good I mean dates that have been run in recent years with AMS dating on identified charcoal or identified material that we really trust because the other dates that we got years ago or more uh, those days radiocarbon dating was a lot more, more primitive so to speak and we didn't identify the charcoal so we were it was probably identified more wood at various times and so on but Bellows has been redated from the materials that were curated at the museum and we're pretty confident. Tom died in that work, which I'm not familiar with. What's the age? Uh, it's, you know, like, that is you have an age range, right? But it's, it's from like, I don't know, about 1050 to maybe 1250 is the range on that. And I'm thinking probably around 11, 11 months or something. Now, we also have, you know, in terms of the time down when people got here, um, we've got a number of dates on charcoal influxes and pollen cores, right? Swamp cores. Around water in particular, and also in Hawaii, and dates on the Polynesian area's wrap. And, and those, in combination, I'm saying, uh, are indi indicate about a thousand AD, and again, put a plus minus 100 on that. But, so a little earlier than the Bellows itself. So I say it's not the first, it falls within what I'm calling the foundation period, which is 200 years. But 
I'm sure there were earlier rules that are lost. Um, since you're concerned about the traditional Hawaii, Hawaiian um, agricultural sustainability, I wondered how perhaps your research might inform uh, perhaps uh, a return to some of those agricultural principles to promote sustainability in contemporary. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely. I mean, I hope that. You know, there will be some, uh, you know, some influence from our work, right, towards efforts to reactivate or rejuvenate traditional practices. And one of the things that uh, it's been clear to me, and I've talked to a number of people about, is, you know, you have places like Halong, where you have this whole infrastructure of agriculture, traditional agriculture, these stone terrace complex. You have thousands of stone terraces in Halong. Right? They're overgrown now, most of them in Java Plum. But it's there. It could be put back into agriculture. Right? You've got to cut the invasive species out, but it's there. Wailao Valley is even bigger. It's covered in these terraces. Pelikonu Valley, Waikolo Valley. Right? Now, the, part of the problem is, guess what? <clears throat> these things are all classified by the state or zone as conservation district, right? which puts huge barriers in front of somebody wanting to go out and do agriculture. Why they were Zone like this, I don't know. I don't understand it. No. But those whole valleys are in conservation. To me, the valley floors of these ought to be zoned agriculture, but probably with the stipulation traditional agriculture, right? Not one where you can go in with big plows or whatever. I hate to say it, but if it were zoned ag, I think the first thing that would go in would be a golf course. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it needs to be, you need to have a different kind of ag zoning. I oh, do. You do. Traditional ag zoning, which I don't think exists. Yeah. So, yeah. but if we could get that through the legislature and get these areas zoned traditional ag, then this will allow for Native Hawaiian schools who own black and so on. And there are people who do want to do this, who go in and reactivate these things. But as long as they're going to be zoned conservation, it puts huge barriers. You have to get special exemption permits in order to, uh, to do this. It'd be hard to get funding and so on. So that's one of the things that become clear to me working on that. This, this, this is uh, something, but this is in the political realm, obviously. You know, to change that means that the ledge has got to, has got to change that. I'm hoping that you know, people like the young uh, state legislator of Molokai, Mahima, Poi Poi, you know, people like this, she's very keen on sustainable agriculture. And so we get people like her in, get them on the Ag Committee. Yeah. And, Part of the question I just said, you know, we had is we wanted to show, especially with the wet taro agriculture, is it really sustainable? Because people assert this, this is sustainable. But was it really? And the ways we can test this, right, in terms of soil nutrients, food sequence, and so on. And it looks like it was. It looks like it was. But it's be nice to know that, right? To be able to say, yeah, it is sustainable. And here's the empirical evidence of that. And not just, you know, assert something. I don't want to dominate so much so much else. Um, my question is a fun question in regards cultural appropriation. And I'm thinking about the debates between Kesey and Hamani Trask about who has standing, especially non Hawaii, who has standing to um, to enter these fields and to study and to make pronouncements about something that is non Hawaii. So this is a very lingering wound that would never go away, but... That's a, a very complicated question, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, a good question, you know, someone like myself, I'm not native born, but I was born and raised here. Uh, but when I go and do something like in Ottawa, I do it first by going to the community and asking permission. We first went and talked to him. He gave his blessing to the world. He's done great work with us, actually hired him as a research assistant. So, you know, I feel very important that someone like when somebody, I need to do this work as part of the community and be uh, welcomed. You know, if I get the vibe, you're not welcome, you're not welcome I'll right out. Right? So, that's all I can say from my point of view. And we also, you know, my team, we were very uh, careful to we follow the cultural protocol. So, we made the one hand, the one to 
add on to the culture. Um, Aloha, Dr. Kirk. I'm Monday. I'm on the idea, and I was actually your student in a Hawaii Dental of History at Cal. Oh, um, my gosh. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, how long ago? Uh, I think it must have been 96. So long. <laughs> <laughs> so it's wonderful to see you here. Yeah. Um, my question is you had said something as like a throwaway line in a class, which actually stuck with me, which was, you can look at the Hawaiian myths and Mo'olelo and actually find the places, mm -hmm. uh, which you can't always do with other forms of mythology. So I was wondering if you do, in fact, work with any of the stories. You had mentioned um, now there's so many Mo'olelo speakers. Um, do you work with anyone trying to combine um, Hawaiian language resources with your archaeology? Not so much a Hawaiian language. I mean, I'd love to. I'll <laughs> 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 but you know, as far as the Hmong level, I'll uh, just comment on that because it's something that earlier on in my career, uh, you know, most archaeologists you know, in a way we didn't pay a lot of attention to the Hmong level, say in the 80s. So, right? um, I really changed over the course of my career, particularly about, I think it was around 20 years ago, when I began working on what became called, came to be called How Chiefs Became Kings, and then the popular version of so the short version of this kind of cheating and, and I don't know if you've read any of those books, but in those I really do engage with the moral language. I went back and I, I reread, I was like, I'm only reading it in the English translation, but I read Kamakama and Mongo and so on. And I came to the realization for myself that these moral they're not myth. I mean there is a component that's myth when we get back, you know, far back in time. But at least twenty five generations or so. I regard this as history. Uh, maybe because it's orally transmitted, it's more easier perhaps to make some changes or things in the stream of it's written. But it's just true. And I firmly believe that all the people who are referenced to were real people and did real things. And so I've tried increasingly to integrate archaeology with the Mono. And we can do this in reference to some specific sites where on you know, Kawiki Hill and Amon, right, the fortress of the Kawiki is a so the Molokai is actually working on a dissertation. Just to say, Akubi, Akubi, they call it Heo, but it's actually probably a residential site of the Lee, and it's uh, linked to Kiha Pihilani from Maui when he had to flee, but he was fighting with his brother Lomo Pihilani. Uh, so, I mean, now I can go on to other examples of it. Mana Heo and Halawa is said to be dedicated by Alapai Nui. In the fight with the Kolaug chiefs. So you can go on and on and on. And I think we should not be neglecting that. You know, there are different ways of, when I tell my class, archaeology is one way of knowing the Hawaiian past, or knowing about the Hawaiian past. And well, that was another way of knowing about the Hawaiian past. But they don't have to be kept completely separate. Right? We, we can see where there are the intersections. And I think the intersections give us a richer uh, understanding of. Just one or the other. That was great, you were my You never know. Oh, wait, what are you doing here now? I'm actually a PhD student uh, in the English department, and I'm doing my dissertation on Tihawakine and Mokuula. So I'm looking, I'm actually translating the Tihawakine story from the first one. Oh, okay, fantastic. Heavy duty mouth. Yep, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's great. Yeah. I, I did a, I think it was published, I gave a talk at the Hawaiian Archaeology meetings in the five, six years ago. I don't know all about Kiva Day and Kupi Lodi. I can send you the text. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.